I take it this evening is informal and it's not the uh, it's not the time or place for me to indulge in, a, in, in an adulation of France. Now, just to call one or two salient facts, he was born in the 30s decade rather than the 20s decade. Point one. At the beginning. Right at the beginning. Point two, he trained as an architect before he did anything else of note. He was at the AA at the same time as John Miller, Adrian Gale, Lee Brown, Patrick Hodgkins, and others of that ilk. Um, he is um, not very clear, or rather we're not very clear, what he did immediately after qualifying at the AA. He comes to light, really, uh, uh, when he appears as an associate of Douglas Stevenson Partners from 1959. That's when we start to notice KF. How could you miss me? <laughs> and there he designed and built flats at Craven Hill Gardens, which are still standing, and and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> since not very many flats of the uh, 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 were built in the Italian style, uh, has quite an important uh, place, I think, in the history of modern architecture in London. From 62 to 65, he was known technically as the technical editor at Architectural Design, but it is also well known that his activities extended far outside the technical field as Monica Vision will tell you. Um, from 66 to 72, he was on the faculty at Princeton University, where he used to suffer the throes of having to commute frequently to New York. We won't go into that any further. Uh, at New York, he was working on a low-rising, uh, low-rise housing prototype, which eventually took form, took built form in the Marcus Garvey Park Village at Brownsville. Brooklyn and is actually occupied by ordinary people at the present time. He's now on the faculty at Columbia and is a fellow of the Institute of Architecture and, Ur of Architecture and Urban Studies in New York, the Peter Eisenman Institute, for those of you who don't know it under the other name. He's the author of Modern Architecture, A Critical History, uh, and of innumerable articles. Like Bannum, K.F. combines the discipline of a historian with the vision of a critic. Perhaps he fulfills both these roles so well because he's also possessed of the insights of an architect. As another who would like to be known, uh, someone of whom it would be possible to say, uh, for him to say, I am a tripod, I'm glad to be asked to introduce Kenneth tonight. Thank you. Well, I don't know about the Italian style of Craven Hill Gardens, but um, I think it's perhaps it would be better if it had actually been taken down by now, but in any case, I'm somehow overwhelmed that there are so many people in this room and in this very beautiful house. Um, and I decided I would try uh, the not very promising topic of trying to talk about the present situation, which is like, I suppose, trying to talk about everything. And uh, the main, um, well, what I would hope for is that, that I would try to get through this as, uh, well, not in, not in indecent haste, but in uh, perhaps too uh, brief a time for uh, the various issues that I would like to touch on, in order that we could have a discussion and perhaps um, uh, produce rather more unexpected um, results than what I have kind of scribbled out on this piece of paper. I, I was thinking as I, I, as I made these notes, uh, since I don't really believe entirely in informal occasions, that um, I think uh, someone that, anyway, Robert knows as well as I, a kind of wunderkind called Emilio Ambas says that the most important thing about spontaneity is it has to be rehearsed. And um, this hasn't been very well rehearsed, but on the other hand, it's perhaps been too well rehearsed in as much as, uh, I don't know, I sometimes look back at different things I've written and think that really I'm just saying the same thing over and over again. I should probably just stop, you know, because uh, I don't seem to be going... Uh, into sort of new territory very much. And so, so well, for some people anyway, uh, 
what I have to say would be uh, perhaps boringly familiar. And uh, on the other hand, I mean, you will be relieved to hear a lot of things have been left out, and a lot of people perhaps have been left out, which is uh, perhaps invidious, but inevitable. Actually, one of the uh, things that came to mind as I, I sat down is that um, uh, uh, about two weeks ago, just over two weeks ago, there was a review uh, in New Haven, Yale, uh, James Sterling's class in New Haven, and uh, somewhat transformed James Sterling um, in a very benevolent mood, decided, or perhaps under pressure, I'm not sure which, that at the end of the review there would be a discussion of um, a certain kind of student anxiety. And um, there was arranged in that room the um, deans of, uh, or anyway, ostensible leaders of both Harvard, uh, Columbia, <coughs> Yale, and uh, who had been on this review panel. And the students started to complain bitterly over the fact that uh, they thought that almost no teachers in Yale today would take any kind of responsibility for what they were supposedly uh, uh, professing. And uh, the, the sequestered uh, Caesar Pelli, Dean of Yale, had to sort of sit there and take it. I mean, it wasn't that painful, but I think he rather wished it had not occurred. And Pelli defended himself by saying, well, you know, after all, we have to just give a few sk skills in graduate school, and, uh, uh, and then after that you go to work for 10 years with Skidmore Owens in Maryland, you really learn what the game's about. But for kids who are paying seven thousand or eight thousand dollars a semester, you know, well, I don't think as much as that, but uh, a year to 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 go to an Ivy League school for three year graduate school and all the rest of it, doesn't seem quite an adequate uh, answer. And I guess that that confusion inside um, schools is paralleled. Well, it would seem, after all, if one reads things like architectural design and other publications, to be paralleled by. Uh, an enormous amount of confusion outside. And I thought that uh, by way of provocation, I would try to, anyway, touch on some of the things that I think about this present situation and uh, see if one could uh, ground some kind of discussion around that. Um, I, I feel slightly embarrassed by, by, well, by the introduction and by this occasion as much as uh, I've obviously left the house, so to speak, but I keep on coming back, and that leads to lots of rude remarks about are you here or there. Actually, it reminds me of um, uh, someone, I think his name is Shane de Blackham, who is quite a talented Irish architect in Dublin, who uh, told me that, um, that uh, oh, I, in fact, I, I, was, I was struck by the fact in Dublin that people talked about uh, various absent Irish people as being gone, and it struck me as a sort of very curious word that was sort of enunciated in a rather strange way, and he said, as though they were, you know, forever gone, and he said that uh, people have been migrating from Ireland for the last, uh, you know, 120 years or so, and when they do do that, we speak about them as being gone. And uh, he said, on the other hand, of course, we're quite happy about their departure. And when we meet them unexpectedly, you know, maybe nine months later in Grafton Street, they show up in front of us and we say, are you back or what? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I feel as though I've been going on with being back or what for quite some time. And that also, I suppose, uh, uh, applies to my somewhat um, ambiguous situation in as much as I uh, was trained as an architect and I suppose I had ideas that I would practice architecture and I suppose I have uh, rather made rather lame endeavors to do so uh, but uh, I somehow seem to have ended up teaching and writing I suppose it's some kind of pathology and uh, here I am in my pathological position once again uh, reminded of that kind of chestnut aphorism about those who, who can do and those who can't teach. I think that architecture, of course, going back to the Yale uh, <coughs> vignette, sits very uncomfortably inside the university. It surely is uh, some kind of craft. 
as much as it is a profession, and perhaps it's more important to think of it as a craft. Of, but again, that doesn't seem to be quite right. But in any case, it has always uh, been very uncomfortably ho housed inside the liberal university, in my opinion. I suppose the other thing that is necessary to say is that, uh, well, maybe not necessary, but I feel like saying it, is that uh, in some curious way, uh, I think uh, I left England in 65 as a sort of vague liberal of sorts, and I think that I have shifted slightly to the left, but almost imperceptibly, but nevertheless, there is uh, something about the... Uh, unvarnished realities of American society and its contradictions, which makes one realize that there are contradictions elsewhere of a rather heavy kind. And they particularly uh, uh, in, impinge rather savagely on, uh, on architecture and on, on uh, the environment in general and on cities and so on. Uh, amongst my obsessions, which I think I... Uh, acquired from reading uh, Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition, uh, where she goes out of her fastidious intellectual way to distinguish between labor and work, uh, arguing more or less that labor is a state of affairs in which that, is produced, that which is produced is consumed, and work is a state of affairs in which that which is produced is not intended for consumption. Uh, I, I, I actually was encouraged to read this book by Sam Stevens, who uh, I think had an enormous influence on a lot of people in the uh, 50s in this country. And, uh, and But I, uh, being somewhat backward, I did not read it until 65 when I went to America, and the two things seemed to come together in a particular way. And it struck me that the Arendtian distinctions between work and labor could parallel a distinction between architecture and building. In fact, uh, I made a big fuss out of the fact that if you look up the Oxford English Dictionary, it doesn't quite work in Webster's. That the Oxford English Dictionary defines architecture in two ways. One is the erection of edifices for human use, and the other one is the action and process of building. If you look up edifice, of course, you get a large and stately building, such as a church, a palace, or a fortress. And edifice is also from Latin uh, to make a hearth, uh, which suggests the public uh, connotations of architecture. And, uh, and whereas the action and process of building, of course, suggests sort of unfinished business uh, and perhaps private aspects, although in this very privatized society, we tend to give all the um, priority to the private and not very much to the public. That kind of split uh, sort of, I would say, obsesses me. And uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, to a lot of you, this will be sort of boringly familiar. I mean, the I just want to inform you that in the 1982, that obsession has not gone away. And other splits, of course, which would, uh, uh, I think, uh, well, anyway, have, of course, obsessed a lot of people, um, perhaps more than the business of architecture and building, is the split between engineering and architecture which actually, of course, begins, uh, actually is institutionalized in France on a professional basis in the middle of the 18th century when the first school of engineering, in a strict sense, uh, comes into existence. And actually, it was a school of bridges and roads. So it was uh, engineering for a particular purpose, which was, of course, to uh, boost the economy, to, to distribute everything all over the place as universal, universally as possible and not to be bogged down, literally, you know, for half the year and so on. In fact, the French uh, were much more advanced in this uh, respect than the English. And we had to wait for a sort of inventive Scot to uh, help us out of the mud, so to speak. Um, well, actually, the whole French business, the whole French obsession with uh, uh, which I suppose leads to the split between engineering and architecture with infrastructure <clears throat> and with uh, roads uh, really has its origins a century before, in the middle of the 17th century, with uh, Louis XIV and with uh, 
and in the time of Descartes, of course, Cartesianism. And in the, in the time of Claude Perrault, and, uh, uh, well, I suppose this may be entirely familiar, and it also may seem at this moment to be an unduly academic digression, but uh, in, in unpacking this Pandora's box, I, I, I would like to say that I have of recent date become uh, not uh, uh, an authority on, but at least uh, better informed about Claude Perrault, uh, who I think by profession actually a medical researcher into uh, muscular function and anatomy, uh, an intellectual uh, commissioned by Colbert to uh, write a new introduction to Vitruvius and also commissioned by Colbert to establish some kind of theory of architecture prior to Colbert's founding of the Academy uh, Royal, the Academy Royal of uh, D'Architecture. Uh, there's an interesting little sidelight to that, which is that uh, if one puts on one side architecture and the state, or let's put into one bracket architecture, classicism and the state, and on the other side, uh, craft production, vernacular, and something not as global as the state, decentralized. Um, you could, of course, associate with the second bracket, uh, guild production. And in fact, for uh, Colbert was dead set against guild production and, the, and guild power, and wanted, of course, to have only power given to the centralized state. And the creation of the academies was uh, a, a, conscious body of, a conscious policy on the part of Colbert to destroy the guilds. And in order to give authority to this academy, he uh, 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 basically hired uh, Perrault to, uh, in a sense, uh, destroy the existing establishment in architecture and establish a new uh, theoretical basis. Now, this leads Perrault to distinguish between positive and arbitrary beauty uh, and of course, but I suppose I should say before that, that um, uh, the, the main aim of Perrault's uh, operation is to destroy the uh, uh, quasi-mystical divine belief in humanist proportions, uh, the, the Vitruvian uh, variable mystique, really. And uh, Perrault uh, doesn't uh, and that's what's categoric and categorically different about his theory of architecture is that he completely dispenses with the importance of proportion altogether. And uh, proportion does not feature in his positive and arbitrary beauties. And what is interesting uh, about his positive beauties is that they are the beauties which, which are universal and he restricts them to three things. They are uh, symmetry, um, precision in execution and richness of materials. Uh, whereas arbitrary beauty uh, is all local cultural circumstance and variable, not universal. And as a intellectual behind the, the idea of the rational state, it's quite clear, you know, that, that uh, even though he says that uh, arbitrary beauty is not to be despised, nevertheless one can quite see that what is coherent with Cartesianism and with reason is some kind of universal standard which is then grounded in richness of materials, um, precision of execution, and symmetry. Uh, I think that you could bend symmetry to embrace proportion, but basically I think it means what one usually associates with this notion. Now, I, I think that this business of the universal versus the local, uh, or the universally rational versus the, uh, the locally idiosyncratic, uh, is, is, is a kind of uh, opposition which has not gone away, and which uh, uh, runs through the present situation in a, in a, in a very curious way and uh, I think uh, is uh, perhaps in, in insufficiently articulated or, or, or particularly in current debate in any case, you know. 
Now, um, that's that's the end of the first part of this thing. I mean, what now follows is a, is a bit of a jump. Uh, because uh, despite the fact that I'd been sort of, uh, I suppose, uh, overindulging in uh, roaming around in rather remote periods of history, I think in the end, uh, you know, uh, I mean, human life is very short and history, you know, depends on what scale you measure it by when one comes to talk about what is remote. In some ways, Descartes is not such a long time ago. But I, but the break now in this little presentation for me uh, sits somewhere like this, which is that um, but one way to introduce one one way to talk about this break is to mention a talk given a year ago in Frankfurt by Jürgen Habermas, German philosopher. Uh, I suppose the uh, the inheritor of the mantle of the Frankfurt School of Philosophy actually given in Frankfurt on, uh, as, uh, on the occasion of receiving the, the Adorno Prize, which was about modernism and postmodernism, and a uh, uh, left-wing philosopher uh, used the occasion to defend what he calls the modern project against various shades of conservatism. And he then tried in typical German fashion to categorize different shades of conservatism from young conservatism to neoconservatism uh, to, to old conservatism. And I don't want to bother you with it, but uh, uh, in my opinion, Robert Stern, of course, qualifies for being a neoconservative. But um, so do uh, uh, the Cambridge School, or what I think is otherwise called the Peterhouse School. I have in mind Messrs. Gavin Stamp, uh, Morton Crook, um, David Watkin, well, and uh, John Harris sits pretty well in that school as far as I can see, and so on and so forth. I mean, I do mean the uh, ideologues that are behind the present Lutyens retrospective in the Hayward. Uh, they are, of course, postmodern without any question about it. Um, now, this crisis of modernism has a uh, interesting history, really. Um, I think one of the big shocks to, uh, um, anyway, to Marxist modernists in the 30s, late 30s, was to have to swallow the fact that uh, both the Soviet Union and uh, uh, the Italian fascist state and the Third Reich had in various ways given up the modern project, or at least given it up in terms of its ideological or visible dimension, and, uh, uh, and adopted something that was more, uh, uh, well, uh, influential, uh, gratifying, uh, effective from the point of view of uh, uh, perhaps controlling or satisfying public desire. Um, I don't know whether you know, but the Third Reich had at least five different styles, and those styles were very carefully tuned to different situations, so that, in fact, uh, factories were uh, functionalist, Neuerzachlichkeit, but, of course, the state was neoclassical or late Romantic classical. The, uh, the party workers were trained in medieval Wagnerian castles. Uh, the ordinary people lived in kind of heimat cottages for a kind of ersatz vernacular, and uh, one could enjoy oneself, strength through joy, in Rococo interiors. Um, so everything was very carefully tuned. Also, the Third Reich is interesting from another point of view. It's, it's the moment when you could say, from the point of view of power, architecture becomes less interesting and media becomes much more interesting. Uh, the fact that the Nuremberg buildings were set up with very careful consideration for camera angles, the fact that Goebbels knew what the radio meant in terms of controlling uh, society and, and creating an ideological base, I think historically marks that moment where architecture becomes less important from an ideological point of view, at least less important to the state in a sort of overt way. 
And for Clement Greenberg, American art critic, the fact that the Third Reich and the Soviet Union, above all, of course, Soviet Union, since he was a Marxist, uh, had uh, given up the modern project as far as culture was concerned was a shock and it led him really to develop his whole kind of argument about the autonomy of art that the only way to save culture really was to make for some kind of artistic autonomy until such time as either the society and above all of course politically but also society from the point of view of the level of culture in the society was raised to such a point that some connection could be re-established between the life world and culture. In other words, he, he argued for a total divorce between the life world and culture as the only way of sustaining culture at all. Because a total divorce between life world and culture is an extremely difficult thing to achieve in architecture. It's all very well for painting, maybe, or sculpture, or music, uh, or even literature, but architecture has a hard time in achieving a total divorce between life world and culture. Well, what has that got to do with the present? Well, uh, uh, in some ways, I do think that the postmodernist operation is certainly against the modern project. Oh, the very interesting point that uh, Habermas makes vis-a-vis -vis neoconservatives is that they are not against the modern project from an instrumental point of view. They have no word to say against it at all. They are against it from an expressive point of view. They want it to appear that nothing has happened but one can go on with the motorways and the jet aircraft and the atomic power stations and everything else you can imagine, as long as it seems, in terms of you know, everyday life, that nothing has happened, that we are still in Edwardian England, and that uh, we can mediate against that. I once heard Gavin Samp say in public, the 20th century, the terrible, that terrible thing we all have to bear, you know. Um, and... Uh, so I mentioned uh, Greenberg and the very tricky number of, of the autonomy of art on the one side, you know, and, and also the, I didn't actually give its title, but he wrote an essay in 939 called Avant-Garde and Kitsch, in which he really first adopted this position. And of course by Kitsch he did mean social realism and Third Reich architecture and, uh, well, the more pompous aspects of uh, the Italian style circa the late 30s, Piacentini. And, of course, kitsch is the, the, the big uh, problem that, in a way, uh, you know, the, the embarrassing number one topic that nobody wants to talk about, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis postmodernism, since uh, it does seem that, uh, you know, uh, to be heavily weighted towards kitsch. Now, it, it, it depends, of course, on, on uh, I mean, the, I mean the, real, the real difficulty, I suppose, for architects or for uh, people involved in the arts today is this whole problem of populism and the extent to which, you know, what is done is accessible to the people. I mean, whoever they are, I suppose they also include us, but I mean, this question of, uh, I mean, the big argument about postmodernism is, of course, you know, gratification, it's accessibility, ordinary person understand it, they really get a kick out of it, etc., etc. And modern architecture, they do not get a kick out of it, and they don't understand it, they don't want it, and it's enough of it. And, <coughs> and I mean, this is, I'm vulgarizing the whole position, but I'm sure you know it uh, all too well. But the difficult thing which I think, uh, you know, uh, people like Loos recognized as long ago as 1910 is that uh, a vernacular in the strict sense can only exist when the category of beauty does not exist. And in his uh, very beautiful, I think absolutely staggering text, which is just called Architecture, published in 1910, in, wh in which he talks about uh, peasants building a house and then he describes the whole business and then he says and the guy builds a roof and he says and what kind of a roof is it he says it's the same roof as his grandfather built and his great-grandfather built and his great-great-grandfather built and so on and so forth and then he says and is it a beautiful roof or an ugly roof and then he says he doesn't know it's the roof 
Now, under those conditions, that is vernacular. But once those conditions have gone, they've gone forever, in my opinion, but forever. And I think we are all the urbanized, uprooted, I mean, all of us. I mean, uh, I don't know anybody who doesn't work in what is called tertiary industry. I, I don't mean anybody who works in either primary or secondary industry. It's probably my problem, but that's the fact. <coughs> and, and, and people who do work in that industry, which is the information industry, basically, are all, in a way, urbanized and uprooted, one way or another. They have no access to the vernacular at all. And, and the faintest idea what the vernacular means in cooking or in anything else. They are, in a sense, the, 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 the a kind of cosmopolitan universal product. I mean, that's not a bad, good, good term at all. They, they, are, they are the result of, that, of, they, of these kind of, I think, enormous historical transformations. And so, you know, in what kind of, of, of direction can one uh, move architecture? Or, or in what kind of position can one adopt in relation to what I think is, is really a pretty heady confusion at the moment, in, 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 in general, perhaps not, certainly not just in architecture, because if one takes the art scene, or at least the art scene in New York, uh, w which has really become commodity culture with a capital C, uh, where, you know, a desperate art market will sell anything and a desperate public will buy anything at the moment, as long as, you know, it's... Uh, We've got to keep the whole thing moving, mind you, because otherwise we'll starve, you know. I mean, I'm being vulgar, and uh, I mean, I'm sure there, it, it's much more complex than that, but I think there is a lot of that uh, uh, kind of, you know, repressed... Uh, I was going to use the word panic, but I suppose that's not really appropriate. Anyway, they're doing very well. I mean, uh, Julian Schnabel, who's the latest sort of expressionist wunderkind in New York, you know, uh, sells pseudo-expressionist uh, canvases at $60,000 a time, and people are queuing up to buy it. So I suppose everything's all right, really. But um, that doesn't really help the situation in architecture. <clears throat> and uh, the other day, in uh, sort of um, in the... Uh, how can I put it? I mean, in a sort of very de decadent scene that occurs in a club in New York, or, or this particular scene occurred in a cl club in New York, involving Philip Johnson, who uh, seems to still be able to corrupt uh, pretty well everybody. Uh, uh, um, Francesco Danco, uh, an Italian Venetian intellectual, very bright. Uh, ambitious protege of Manfredo Tafuri and member of the Italian Communist Party came and talked about Mies van der Rohe to the surprise of everybody but, and to the discomfort of Philip Johnson who would like to forget about Mies van der Rohe. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he talked about him in a very, I thought, remarkable and interesting way because he said, you know, that in his opinion uh, the buildings of Mies van der Rohe are, amongst other things, about the impossibility of building a home or of coming home in this deep vernacular sense of being able to do that. So that on the one hand, they are about uh, modern materials, they're about reason, they are about uh, technique, but they are also about a kind of... Uh, a condition of loss in the modern world which cannot be overcome. I mean, I mean I'm paraphrasing it. These didn't actually say that, but I think that's, that's at least could be, of course, you know, the impossible thing. That's how I understood him. When one gets into these areas, there is room, I suppose, for a lot of other kinds of confusion. But I thought it was a very interesting uh, uh, argument. And recently, uh, another architect who I think in some ways is close to me has become more and more important to me, and that is Louis Kahn, and I was talking to, well, very, just a brief aside, to Norman about Kahn. Because uh, it seems to me that Kahn uh, was on to all this a long time ago. In 1944, Kahn uh, wrote an absolutely extraordinary essay, which is called Monumentality. And uh, which appears in a, in a symposium that took place in Colombia 
uh, run by Paul Zucker called uh, Modern Architecture and City Planning, but that's a very misleading title because inside everybody wrote about monumentality or talked about the issue of monumentality. And there was a great deal of anxiety then about monumentality. That anxiety had got to do, of course, with the uh, loss of confidence in the modern project, the whole uh, social realist climate of the New Deal and also in the Soviet Union and in the Third Reich and elsewhere. And there was a feeling on the part of people like Gideon, above all, uh, cert, that, uh, that the society needed to have monuments for reasons of identity, etc., and other, other reasons were given also. And, the, and this uh, symposium really came out of that, and Karl uh, did a very interesting, uh, wrote a very interesting paper in the symposium. Now, what was interesting about Kahn's paper is that he based the whole um, burden of proof of monumentality on structure. And actually, one found in the, if you read that text carefully, that what, what bothered the hell out of Kahn was not so much monumentality as the authenticity or the legitimacy or the authority of the language he was using. And he reached for structure I mean, influenced by Buckminster to Fuller, as a matter of fact, at that time, to determine the, the authenticity of his elements. And uh, in, in other words, what he tried to argue was that, uh, I mean, he, he, there's, there's a long diatribe against the standard steel section, which he sees just as a production object. And there's a whole thing about, you know, using welded tubes, which even have varying diameters, which of course is an impossibility from a production point of view, but that those varying diameters would then reveal the interaction between the artifact, invention, and nature, because of the revealing, of course, the stress changes in the object. And therefore, have, he doesn't use these terms, but this is again an interpretation, gain legitimacy out of the interaction between the artifact invention and natural order, natural law, and overcome the Cartesian doubt, in a sense, that I referred to in, the, in relation to Perrault's distinctions between positive and arbitrary beauty. And so I think that if you look at Kahn's work, you find that it is really made very much of the positive beauties of Perrault, i.e. richness of materials, although you can debate whether they are rich or not, I suppose. Precision of execution, symmetry. And of course, you can add, a f I mean, th this business of structure uh, remains for Kahn, not present in the Perrault case. I think a, a, an element which uh, it is used as a kind of positive, uh, legitimized uh, tectonic component that has, has, uh, has uh, indisputable authority, really. I think that's the intention, at least, you know. Now, in that sense, Kahn, I think, is very alone in the American scene. I think that most American architects are, couldn't be less interested in structure. I think he's, uh, his, his largest influence has been uh, uh, outside of America, really. I mean, the, the so-called followers of Kahn are a joke, if you think of, uh, I mean, even Venturi, I think. The early Venturi, yes, but it quickly gets forgotten, and even from the point of view of structure, I think, never understood, certainly not understood from the issue of the precision of materials. Uh, uh, precision of execution, richness of materials, and for Charles Moore, well, you can forget it already, you know, I mean, you can see that really the so-called Philadelphia School never understood a thing about Kahn, I think. It was actually a very beautiful story of uh, when they were going to have the centennial in Philadelphia, there was a, 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 a pinning up of drawings for various competing architects, and Robert Venturi and Louis Kahn were pinning up on the same occasion. That the, Robert, uh, Louis Kahn got there earlier and was pinning up ink and pencil drawings of, of a project for the centennial. And after a time, Venturi came in and started to pin up colored drawings of the strip. And after a time, Kahn can't stand it any longer and turns to him and says, you know, Bob, color ain't architecture. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, th there is a beautiful reply because Venturi said, and you know, Lou, a centennial exhibition ain't architecture either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened after that, but in any case, I think, it, I think it's a beautiful story because I think it does um, speak about the predicament of architecture today and, and, in my opinion, also about the importance of Kahn. 
I mean, the other thing I think that's very interesting about Kahn, and I only realized it very recently, is Kahn's attitude to the city. Uh, I suppose it's, one has to be thick not to realize it earlier. I, I never quite took it too seriously, Kahn's attitude to the city, but if you look at the, all the projects of Philadelphia, there is a real effort on the part of Kahn to, uh, in a sense, sustain the myth of the city against a historical condition which is completely antipathetic to the myth of the city. In a way, for Kahn, Philadelphia was, I think, uh, you know, the mythic city. And, I mean, it was, well, basically, it wasn't his birthplace, but it was, you know, his complete origin. And, um, in fact, I once met somebody who told me that a young student, well, no, more, not anymore a young student, but when a student going from Cambridge in Massachusetts to see Kahn and having an appointment with Kahn and Kahn saying to him, take the train, don't come by the plane. Well, in fact, he did come by the plane but told Kahn that he had taken the train. And we talked about why, why would Kahn make such an absurd request. And I came to the conclusion, to, for, for other reasons, which, which perhaps are not really possible to sustain, you know, the, the way Kahn died in Penn Station and so on, that perhaps for Kahn, the only way to enter Philadelphia was through 30th Street Station. You couldn't enter Philadelphia from the airport because uh, there were, you couldn't enter it. You just, you were sucked into it, like sort of, as you are from most airports into most cities. You don't really go into a city. You, you are part of a megalopolitan region. I think that Kahn represents a kind of romantic, if you like, heroic attempt to uh, sort of sustain the city in fragments, really. Uh, and, uh, and of course, to, to uh, build monuments, I suppose. And I think he did do that. I suppose that I, I don't know, you know, really, I don't really have a conclusion to this speculation. I think that uh, this, well, perhaps really one long digression, I, I think that, uh, that in this present confused situation, uh, that probably it would be advantageous if uh, some kind of position could be taken about this question of what are the limits of architecture uh, in, in, this, in this period of history, I mean, with regard to, uh, well, again, you know, the question of richness and materials, precision of execution, symmetry, etc. This, this question of giving some kind of tectonic authority to the practice of architecture. I mean, one of the things, it seems to me, which is uh, perhaps a, a, an exaggeration, but it, it does seem to me that one of the... Uh, overriding aspects of the postmodernist um, phenomena is that it is extremely scenographic. Uh, it is absolutely obsessed with images, and the more those images can be on the surface, the better. And of course, uh, in some ways, that facilitates very cheap construction, very impermanent construction. It is, in fact, uh, extremely theatrical, both technically and in terms of its intent. Um, and I think that some kind of, uh, you know, critical position with regard to, to what I see as an opposition between what is, you know, uh, the tectonic uh, 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 heritage, if you like, of architecture and the scenographic tendency of what I think of as a neoconservative culture it seems to me to be uh, one opposition which I feel uh, obviously needs a lot of um, examination, but I suppose a certain amount of qualification, but nevertheless, I think uh, represents a sort of urgent um, well dilemma in the present, and I think that uh, the more that could be exposed, the better <coughs> the other only other final point I wanted to make is that 
I, I, well, two points, really. I don't think, of course, that uh, <coughs> architecture turns only on these issues. I think there were uh, liberative, culturally and socially liberative aspects to the modern movement, which um, in some ways have been lost. Uh, I, I suppose I'm thinking of, of the of particularly sensitive organizations of space, which the modern movement was able to achieve, and which I think in many cases has not been equaled in the last uh, maybe five or 10 years of practice. Um, and I do think that that represents a kind of liberative and critical aspect of the modern project, which uh, it would be regrettable if one lost it. That was one sort of addenda I wanted to add. and the final thing is that uh, I wanted to say something again about the city, and, and this isn't really very, very clear, uh, which is that for me one of the most interesting architects, uh, if not the most interesting architect uh, projecting uh, works in relation to the city today is Matthias Ungers. Um, and I think you, not at the architectural level, but at the urbanistic level, there is some relationship between uh, Ungers' attitude to the city and Kahn's attitude to the city. That is, he assumes, you know, uh, although uh, he's not often able to do it, to carry it out in practice, that one of the responsibilities of, of being an architect is to... Uh, um, predicate the practice on the idea that uh, at least the memory of urbanity or of a city can be sustained in fragments. And I think it's extremely important that the notion is the, the sustenance of the city as fragment, because I think the, I think it represents a certain uh, coming to terms with history that, um, that, gen that largely speaking the city is in fragments and that uh, the this nostalgia for the city as a whole is a rather unrealistic nostalgia. One final point. Uh, when, I, when I finished writing this little book, uh, Dalibor Vezelay, who I think you ought to invite here if you're going to go on with these occasions sometime, uh, who I think is an extraordinary erudite and sensitive uh, thinker. Uh, didn't like this little book very much because he thought it was not critical about architecture enough, about modern architecture, that is. And perhaps he's right. But apart from uh, his disapproval, he uh, put me onto an, uh, an idea which I find very uh, interesting, and I, and I think I'll just end with it, which is that he told me that there's about a, a French philosopher called Paul Ricoeur, who um, uh, made the following argument, basically. I mean, distinguished, which I think is something that is well within the German tradition between culture and civilization. And um, argued that in this period of history, uh, there is no developing country in the world that is going to forego the benefits of civilization, uh, the benefits of uh, uh, what, you know, in the mid-17th century with Colbert and Descartes was already the project of universal reason. And, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I, think it's, I, I don't know, I don't see how one can possibly dispute that argument. It seems to me to be... Uh, you know, everything one reads or sees points exactly in that direction. And, uh, and he does mean, of course, modern medicine and modern communications and modern information and, and, and so on and so on. You know. He says that the challenge of this period of history is how one can sustain, you know, some kind of distinct culture and still have the benefits of universal civilization. Now, I mean, for me, postmodernism is ultimately a loss of nerve in relation to this dilemma and is an effort to kind of 
short circuit the whole problem and uh, opt out of it. And uh, I suppose, of course, what I've done is to make a polemic against it. Well, anyway, why don't we have a talk about it? Cool. I think I've said enough. Well, before we start to talk, I feel I have to say that uh, I think I know Kenneth pretty well, and yet he still has this ability to surprise me and to put me right back down, about halfway down through the game, I have to start all over again. So can we just show up again? <laughs> I think I'm going to get a drink while people think <laughs> <laughs> actually occurred and see what went wrong. Now, one of the ways that we all admire about it, and the particular bit you mentioned about the sensitivity of spaces, I mean, like what, exactly what we all think is important about modern architecture. I mean, we actually brought up on those Corbusier sections and, you know, the way you get the things to flow and, the, you know, the Maison Savoie and all that. I mean, that's really what it was all about, isn't it? Now, nobody's built a building like that except as a kind of pastiche of it in America. You know, nobody does it anymore. Now, why don't they do it anymore? The reason is it's not programmable. It doesn't fit into a mass housing system. It's a personal, client, single, one-to-one -one sort of orientation problem. And that is where the, the mechanism has gone wrong. Gone wrong because we have depended on modern architecture, on giant programs, and all the rest of it. It's a question of scale. Now, if each one, anybody here, and I know some of you have actually built houses for individuals, and they're always marvellous. Actually, always marvellous. Look at this house. I mean, it's a splendid house, you see. Now, if there were 50 of them in a row, they would be fucking awful houses. <laughs> <laughs> you can face up to the reality of that equation. Isn't it? <laughs> Yes, they would, they would, because you'd be bored silly by the time you walk past three of them. Oh, phew. <laughs> and as you are, you're <laughs> bored. <laughs> 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 I, I can't agree with that. Uh, I also well, can't agree with that. Go to Milton Keynes uh, and look at it. But there's yeah. more people. Yeah. Similar has to put down the rest of the clothes I spoke down. So. Yes, quite. And maybe I say, just as a rejoinder to, you, to your point, Theon, that uh, there seems to be an awful lot of bad modern architecture around. Well, there's an awful lot of bad architecture around. It's not only modern architecture, it's Victorian architecture, it's Edwardian architecture, it's even um, cheap Jack um, Regency architecture. Um, I think to particularise modern architecture has been, you know, 95% bad. It, it is taking it out of context, of world context. Well, and and, and I, 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 I defend, you know, okay. a, a okay. kind I mean, not of, about of, that. of I, norm of architecture. I'm not arguing about that. I'm Which is damn sight more convenient than the Victorian house. On the way here yeah, today, I went through a whole bloody three square miles of Victorian architecture. It didn't look so bad to me. Yeah. But, but Theo, you're saying that Villa Savoie is marvellous because, uh, among other things, there's only one of them. That's one and uh, reason, uh, yeah. mass housing is difficult to deal with in that way, and something has gone wrong. Now, could you please tell me how you could apply Villa Savoie 
to mass housing and get it come up all right. Well, maybe Seems you to could, me that it's maybe not just could, that. Maybe you could have a little more confidence in the client. You see, the one thing that you had about the Virgil White, there was a client who was actually prepared to pay for that dwelling and had the guts and, the, and so on to do it. Nobody allows current clients, that is, the, the public or whatever it is, the masses, to actually make that decision. They, neither is anybody consulted as to what they want or do or what they would like to have but if, or but how if they like could, to use it. If you could get an expression of the client at all levels of society, wouldn't you still be back with the problem Ken mentioned about popular taste, levels of <coughs> banal that might be taste a lot more satisfactory. Wouldn't you still have that problem? You might have the problem, but it would be at least a lot more satisfactory than having it rammed down your throat by a lot of architects who don't even listen to the brief, which is the current condition. But there have been situations in history when that's exactly what society wanted. I mean, East, I mean, I don't know, East Regent's Park is a very, very boring place. It does go on for an awful long time, mm. that Nash stuff. Uh, presumably, uh, people like it. And what's kind of nice paradox about it is that, is that nobody really wants to customize those boring houses that go off and then ever on those terraces, because they actually like the identity which uh, they get from it. In fact, they get a social identity from it. Mm. And, um, it's, I, I mean, it's, I, mean, I, I, I'm, I, I was fascinated by what you, what you said. It seemed to me to be about lots of oppositions, most of which are um, kind of met metaphors for each other. But, but there's one that um, seems to me rather crucial, which is actually the difference between housing and all other sorts of building. Because housing is essentially a kind of private thing, and it's the absolutely crucial thing. Um, the crucial choice, whereas all other building is institutional, and um, and uh, that that seems to me important, and because of that, perhaps I, it's one of the reasons I find Wright a particularly interesting architect, because in fact um, he attempts a kind of, well, he he, he is he, he set set out to to establish a, a program of public values, almost kind of religious values, through through private housing. And I think he succeeded. Why was that? Well, leading on to that, on to that actually, there's the fact that until probably the last century, um, I, well, I think anyway, that's the way I read it, um, architecture, or the term of architecture was really restricted to large sort of public buildings, and you didn't really call private houses architecture. Um, and it seems to me that the, uh, the term has, has, is now, or now can be applied to a much wider range of buildings, and certainly for me, the two um, for me the two most important <coughs> buildings built for a very long time are uh, Charles Eames's house and the Maison de Verre, both of which are private um, houses uh, built uh, quite economically, not the least bit extravagantly. Um, they don't rely on size, they don't rely on costs, they don't rely on materials um, for their quality. You know, what is it? That gives them that quality and that value, um, you know, above buildings which cost, you know, many, many times more per square foot, and and which are, um, and it seems to me that this is a, a quality of modern architecture that it, it it can be, you know, the quality can apply to more or less anything really, and it doesn't depend on on um, how big it is, or who who owns it, or the politics <coughs> of the setup, you know. Well, I mean, you know, the reason why I, uh, well, I think one of the reasons why I kept on stressing Claude Perrault and this business about uh, richness of materials and precision of execution and so on was, I mean, to, um, I mean, uh, I think that uh, uh, I have a sort of slightly apocalyptic tendency and I think that uh, um, it's a bit uh, out of place, you know, given that you know, this room is full of practicing architects and, um, you know, uh, people will do so many buildings in their lifetime and most of those buildings will be one-off buildings and and those problems will have, will be limited problems and have a definite boundary. And uh, so in terms of what, what people are actually going to do in terms of their practice, um, then, you know, perhaps certain kind of principles are, are worth trying to re- uh, engage in some way or other. That's why I went back to this, uh, I suppose, ridiculously old-fashioned and perhaps too schematic and too simple um, 
business about you know richness of materials, precision of execution, symmetry, etc. You know. Uh, but I suppose there was another uh, aspect of that, which is the, the feeling that um, in this cultural situation, a kind of laconic work uh, is appropriate, you know. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be impoverished. I think one can have a laconic uh, work which is, has the richness. I think that um, that's, uh, that's one, you know, that would be one of my reactions to what to, to this ricocheting uh, conversation, you know. The, the, the other one, which is this, this problem, which I think Team 10 already started to talk about and, and uh, were sort of overwhelmed by, and I suppose everybody is overwhelmed by, is this sheer question of scale and, 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 and concentration and number and the uh, problems that confront uh, society producing for that number. I mean, one of the, uh, to go back to this kind of slightly quirky Habermas address, I mean, one of the interesting arguments he makes about neoconservatives is that they blame onto modernist intellectuals the price imposed by societal modernization. But he says, you know, the, 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 uh, the dis disruption caused by societal modernization were not brought forth by modernist intellectuals. Um, and I think what he means, you know, as far as architecture is concerned, is that these high-rises are also, you know, subject to the laws of production. I mean, reduced to economic reduction. Just take the architectural profession out of it. I mean, you know, it, 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 it would have, um, there would have been a tendency, tendency to go in that direction uh, be because of the kind of uh, uh, very extreme very reductive economic priorities put upon the environment at a certain moment, you know. Now, I think it's interesting, and I think it's also very uh, sinister that uh, the planning discipline, uh, uh, you know, is divorced from the architectural discipline without any question, and has been for the last 15 years. And planning means societal management. It has, couldn't care less about the physical environment, as far as I can see. It is really a branch of economics and of, uh, of, um, of social management. It is a, it is a neo-capitalist science of, the, uh, of a rather perhaps limited dimension, but nevertheless uh, was until recent day considered to be essential. But in any case, divorced from architecture, and I think it's quite interesting that um, you know, there's a tendency for planning schools in the United States to gravitate towards business schools not an accident either, or to schools of public administration and law. Now that leaves a certain very strange gulf in terms of the way the society conceives of itself, because on one side it's reduced it to abstraction, management, pure economy, or pure instrument. You know. On the other side we have freestanding buildings. No, nothing in between, nothing in between. So that Urban design, which is a kind of benighted and embarrassing discipline, you know, is perhaps in a, some ways the missing discipline, actually. Um, in terms of, you know, beginning to think again about what could be significant aggregations without being master plans. You know. uh, because it seems to me that if you, if you got it together correctly, you know, a group of these houses like yours could either be good or just disappear. You know, I mean, one of the aspects of courtyard houses is they don't have elevations. They have a tendency to disappear. Well, if it disappears, that's all right, you know, I mean. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, so I think that, you know, there are certain people who are fanatics, of course, like Peter Land in IIT, who, you know, do nothing else but uh, eat, sleep, dream courtyard houses. But. Uh, I, I, you know, when, if ever, a society would take a move on this point, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I mean, after all, in the end, there is something, there is some kind of ideological fix that everybody has to live in a freestanding house with a garden on all four sides, and, uh, you know, all this business. I mean, you know, well, why does everybody have to live in it? I mean, this is not clear to me, and I think it has to do, in a way, with, with the larger issues of market economy, but who knows? I don't know. I mean, uh, the highest value houses in London are. That, no, in very rare cases. I don't know. Montpellier Square, I've been mean, well, quarter of a million pounds for 25 years. 
Capitalist at all. Yes. But, but you know, I mean, the general model, nevertheless, is this freestanding house, right? As as sold. I mean, not in the centre of cities. Well, no, not in the centre of cities. In old cities, you don't have freestanding houses. But the the the, the new urbanisation tends to move towards that all the time. It seems to me. I mean, perhaps less in this country than in the United States. Now, I was interested in your discussion about vernacular and uh, in relation to maybe an Islington street, um, in the sense that it's a, a matter of how hard you try to solve different aspects of what you consider to be the problem. And if, I mean, those Islington streets, I imagine, weren't designed by architects at all. Oh. They, they were people who thought of what they were doing as being a problem to solve. They didn't have their fathers to tell them how to do it, I imagine, or their grandfathers, so they weren't thinking of the roof as being something which was there forever. Um, but I suppose a lot of people would say that those were very successful pieces of urban design in inverted commas. Yes. And they have, they have, they seem to have some sort of value, don't they? Yes. People want them, want to live in them. Yes. It's partly because of where they are. Um, I think it's partly because they are, that people haven't tried hard, actually. I mean, I'm not even sure that the individual house is, um, is something that everybody wants. The rich, rich people who particularly want to do a particular sort of ego trip might want to <coughs> Other people might be much more interested in location, access, and in not making that form of expression. Well, I think they may, they, they may well be interested in that, but I think that the tendency of the... Um, of, you know, the I mean, at least maybe I misread it. I mean, it seems to me the tendency of the do dominant development ideology, as far as, you know, housing is concerned, is to, is to give up the whole game of building aggregate uh, units and just simply go on doing um, freestanding yeah, houses. You're throwing the baby out with a bathwater. <coughs> I mean, if you read Jane Jacobs, she's analysed the belief about how long streets ought to be, and the fact that very long streets are very boring, and that people don't, don't look after them properly. And you can go and see that in Fulham, <coughs> where you know, we have the next side, where you have short streets are much higher, have higher value, and long streets actually turn out to be, to be lower value. And uh, it's very easy to tell. Now, I mean, that is a lesson to learn about how to make cities. I mean, the, 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 the sort of nuts and bolts of it. Now, those lessons have not been absorbed into the modern canon, in the sense if you go to South London and see them build one of the nice housing states, you see. I mean, it, it's not that uh, there's no goodwill in the system, it's just that that particular kind of knowledge hasn't seeped into the, the business about... Uh, Symmetry and all the rest of it, which is what they really think about. Now, uh, nobody's really complaining about modern art or the, the original modern spirit, which was an honourable, poetic spirit, which tied together all the arts, was actually part of a general cultural movement. What has happened is that the architects have sold out the the, the past to technology. That is to the process, the organizational process of building large things, and have given away all the rest of the problem. We have actually ignored it. All the artists have been put out to graze in the universities, and uh, the poets have disappeared. Now, that's the truth. Um, no, yes, can I mean, I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I respond to that? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, your, your, um, your line is, is, is very, very similar to, uh, to Charlie Jenks' line on, um, on all the magic ingredients which would immediately transform the social ills overnight. Short streets, no architects, no flat roofs, pitch roofs, brick. It's interesting that about three years ago, The Observer, colour magazine, ran an article on the worst vandalism in England. It reached such a high pitch, they focused on it in minute detail. It wasn't designed by architects. It was brick built, it was cul-de-sacs, pitch roof, not an architect, not a thing that you could call modern in the sense that we're talking around now. And, you know, it was the core. I mean, it was like the sort of center of Belfast, except, you know, the IRA weren't there. Um, now, you know, I think that it goes a little deeper than some of the, you know, some of the things that you're talking about. I don't think 
that by, you know, by taking architects out of it, by taking the flat roofs out of it, by bringing it back to a certain coziness, that, you know, that the problems will be solved over that, because the evidence is that, you know, is I that they're not. I don't think that you, you've understood. I, I know nothing against flat roofs, any other kind of roof. All I'm actually for is a kind of totality of experience. I mean, if you're going to do postmodernism, which is one of the things you talk about, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do in the mood of it, the real problem with it is that it's illiterate. Isn't it? I mean, that's what lovely about it. If you look at the, the, the bits that are actually made, is that they're not made well. I mean, they're pasteboard. They you can't make a building out of pasteboard. I mean, it goes against every grain. But what one word. But you use the word not. architect quite, you know, quite repetitively, as if this is, you know, um, <coughs> synonymous with, you know, with, with some of the sort of social ills and such. I mean, it is significant that this particular housing is estate did not involve architects in the sense that you're talking about. I mean, it's significant that, you know, that on his similar sort of hobby horse, I mean, Charlie Jenks and that whole sort of, you know, that philosophical school is that if you took architects out of housing, you know, a lot of the problems would be solved. But what is interesting about that is that they weren't even involved, you know. Um, but Norman, you know very well, I could take you to Peter Smith's building up in, in, in the East End, and you could say the same thing totally. I mean, we're, we're, we're all perfectly aware that it has very little to do with the architecture or the architect in these conditions. What is wrong with that condition is the briefing and the order in which people are packed into those buildings without any previous training about the building, without any feeling about the building, and without actually any commitment to the building. Well, it might not, not yeah, be the I case with long streets the building, as well. That's yeah. critical. It's I can show lots of very nice there. long streets where people well, I was just gonna really say like them. The, the, I don't I'm, believe I'm in sure any of these. The highest real estate has the longest streets. I don't believe in any of these. It's just a demonstration. A lot of these things are the size of streets. Yes, I mean, but it, I mean, so the, this idea that, 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 that you know, you'll have a checklist and that you'll you'll magically sort of identify that you know that all will be good if the street isn't longer than that, isn't wider than that. I mean, I think I don't know much about sociology, but Herbert Gans, the American sociologist, said that. Um, that one has to be very careful about this sort of determinism and that any physical environment has a, a, a number of potentialities which, which will be fulfilled according to its connection to a social environment. And uh, those connections are very difficult to predict the outcome of those connections. And I don't think any of us can I, I really speak with any... I was wondering whether we could authority. drop the idea of streets and housing schemes because I think it, that is really not... Um, getting us very far when we are trying to um, discuss which way architecture should go and whether uh, to sit down and self-consciously invent a certain style is something that can be done at all. I mean, uh, I don't think styles can be invented self-consciously like the postmodernists try to do. I think style is something you can only assess in retrospect and you look back over a period and you can see some similarities and you can then give it a label. But the moment you sit down and create a style, you're really talking about fashion, you don't talk about style at all. With all that that means, novelty, <coughs> impermanence, all sorts of things. And I, uh, I think that is really uh, the crux at the moment of the confusion with students, uh, for instance, at, at uh, schools of architecture. Um, who are desperately, or some of them, trying to sit down and absorb all these kind of fashionable cliches which I've put forward. You know, you can name them. They are the stepped windows, they are the uh, multicolored brickworks, they are the displaced axes, whether they make sense or not. I mean, there's a whole bag of tricks, um, and it's ridiculous, and it's moribund, and, 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 because I don't think we can sit down and invent a style. And that's exactly what the postmodernists have turned, is a kind of remedy to what they consider um, a faceless architecture, usually by giving examples of bad architecture. But Ken's talking to a degree about two things, I think, and he was talking at one level about objects and at the second level about aggregates. And it seems to me that aggregation for architects is in inevitably going to be more difficult than an object. Because um, it's not just a question of scale, um, but it's obviously easier if you've got a small object of, uh, to be uh, more particular, more beautiful, more positive. I think 
About two weeks ago, I listened to probably the best design I've ever heard in my life. And he was, in fact, a watchmaker. And he made one watch a year. And basically, they cost £20,000. And he didn't really matter. He bought them, particularly. But they were the... It, the next watch was going to be the best watch that was ever made because nobody would ever be able to do anything of this quality again. And Look the called Generate. Look called Generate down in East End. Isn't it Generate? Yes. <laughs> but uh, he, it seems to me here you've got the crux of the matter. I mean, Theo's coming out with these time worn sort of, you know, fairly repetitive sort of statements against you know, sort of generalized planners in you know planners in general planners in particular um, having spent about 15 years trying to sort of regenerate planning uh, you know from a kind of uh, callous sort of uh, single dimension objectivity which it's had in this country for the last 20 years and and having failed miserably because whatever I do some quirky little bastard of a housing officer <laughs> is going to dislike one of Norman's schemes on the far fringe of some particular city, okay? And he's going to put every criminal he can find in that scheme. And you wonder why you're going to have a, an immediate, you know, difficult neighbourhood. You know, it's very particular that one goes to Liverpool and you talk immediately to the first police constable you can find. And what they've tended to do over a period of 20 years is to put every listed criminal in Liverpool in the bull ring. And you wonder why the place, you know, is, you know, is steaming with uh, raw pee, is basically peeling at the seams and is dropping to bits. It's not because, uh, you know, they put a balanced group of people in there. It's really basically because those people have been hauled out every ten minutes to, you know, do five or six years in strange ways and then go back again. So, what really worries me about the, you know, the arguments that we've got so far is that why most architects prefer the object to the aggregate in the long term is they've got, like the boxer, the one-on-one. -on -one. You actually know who you're fighting. You know, you've got one guy. And if that guy happens to be a very good client, or if it happens to be yourself, and you happen to have all the uh, objectivity and effort and beauty and artistry that goes with a beautiful thing, then you can produce it. You have the atmosphere to produce it. And I think what we have to talk about, really in a sense, is to create in a country and in a place an atmosphere to produce the goods. And I think we have a country at the moment which is desperately lacking in any form of atmosphere because we spend more time in a kind of masturbation between ourselves than we ever do in times of chasing the realities into the place we're trying to produce. I mean, the awful thing that one realizes, every time you walk into a beautiful medieval city, or you walk into a collection of things which have, have happened together, is that almost every time the, the object of your affection has been despotic, whether it's been Frank Lloyd Wright on the one hand, a kind of you know, benevolent despotism over a, me a method of doing housing, or it's been a Florentine gentry who are putting together a beautiful piece of Florence. Now, what we should be talking about, really, is, is that are we in the object business? If we're going to be an aggregate, certainly, as Ken says, that you've got to do something more than this kind of, you know, asphyxiated idea of, of, of walking from a sort of business school planning sort of numbers game, which America teaches in every planning school, to this almost unbelievably pathetic urban planning thing which is like arranging three buildings, which is absolutely nothing to do with planning even fragments that we're talking about. So it seems to me the creation that we've got to have as a group of people is the atmospherics of a country where every regulation, uh, whether it's literature, whether it's art, whether it's architecture, whether it's engineering, whether it's economics, in fact starts to um, glamorize the situation rather than at the moment which in fact, we spend most of our time sort of, um, I think, just um, talking about, um, well, I don't think I've read an architectural magazine, I think, in the last three years, which I haven't thought is totally trivial, in terms of the, 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 the performance that we're addressing seems to me that, that, that what Robert Stern is doing is so inconsequential in terms of society today as to being, you know, totally irrelevant. Um, the fact that Norman is, is producing a building in Hong Kong 
uh, in terms of um, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, which in fact accepts technology as being an interesting fundamental factor in the building of that particular bank is one thing. The thing that's important to me is the fact the guy has done it with a commercial client who is totally hard-nosed, who has totally, totally bought the idea that Norman's providing him with something which is value for money because he's managed to introduce within the elements of um, all the normal things that, that make an office block tick in, term, in terms of um, value for money around um, uh, circulation space and usable space. He's provided within the elements of that building something which the banker can take on board as thinking he's got total value for money. Now, it seems to me that a building of that nature is winning on three counts. It's winning on the level of art. It's winning on the level of the modern movement, which I think the modern movement is basically what we're doing today well. And it's winning very much, I think, in, in the question of showing Hong Kong with its many very bad high buildings of what a good high building can look like. And that, to me, is really where the importance of architecture and our, our, our in fact, uh, our, our contribution to the world lies, in, is in creating, through what we do individually, um, objects or aggregates, which, in fact, start to move the world a little further in another direction. Norman will do it. Stern won't. <laughs> Yeah. That seems to me to be an argument for charisma in the result, charisma, and more, more particularly for what uh, Marxist critics, critics now tend to call the aura. Aura seems to me to be very important. It's the willing suspension of disbelief. It's the looking for something beyond your client who sold an object which is not the cheapest and most dirt uh, utilitarian that could possibly be. He's buying something more. He's buying quality but he's been persuaded that that quality is necessary. Now, it seems to me that that corresponds to what I call aura, the kind of magic belief in something beyond. And it seems to me that that's where the modern movement has gotten troubled, coming back to Thea's point, that there's been a loss of aura, because what was thought to be produced by this idea of a socialized world where everybody got fair deals has turned out to be quite plainly uh, incomplete. Everybody hasn't got fair deals. The world remains in a way not contrite. The world is still evolving and millions coming up who want basic civilization, color television and whatever. So there is a fundamental problem which won't be put right by anything nice unless you can actually produce aura on order, which is which is I think Peter's Peter Morris point when he says you can't produce style on order. Yeah. Aura is what we need. Yeah, Derek was it's not can't be produced on order. The kind of uh, a culture have to be a sort of cultural Genghis Khan. What about somebody like Terence Conrad, who gives a kind of aura to uh, Genghis Khan. ordinary? Well, yeah, uh, in, <laughs> within the marketplace. I mean, I think that's a, I mean, that's a different kind of Genghis Khan to um, the aristocratic, um, aristocratic patron. Um, uh, and I think, I mean, I, uh, is the situation we find ourselves in, if we are in a market situation now, which certainly I feel well, sort of. Uh, vulnerable about having had all our work hitherto in the, in the public uh, situation. One wonders just what what is going to happen um, and how one can do, do resolve the op opposites which Kenneth has referred to. And it seems to me that perhaps that sort of thing that uh, Conrad and Stalin is, the, is a kind of model. But so have you. I mean, basically, if you take... If you take um, um, chapter housing in Milton Keynes, which I still think is the best housing that's been done in Milton Keynes. Primarily for one That's reason. institutional. It, it's institutional, Richard, but it's still possible to do it within an institutional framework. I mean, what we're talking about is, is, is the products of the best. If you aggregate the best, and we're talking about fragments now, because if you look at anything, if you look, about, if you look at a major film, the best thing you think about are 20 or 30 fragments. It's not the whole thing. It's the same thing in a city. It's almost, in many cases, the same thing in a building. You know, if there's one piece of magic there, and we can produce it, that's going to say something. You know, if you, if you start looking around and say, you know, that um, Hort is a verb because he happened to design in this particular way, and, 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 you know, 
Charlie Sanzo is about because he designed it that particular way. It seems to me to be an, a complete travesty of what we're, the profession we're in. I mean, the fact that we're, we're tending to, to listen to people who are writing amazingly long scripts about where we're supposed to fit in the either modern or postmodern movement seems to me to be hypocritical and stupid beyond belief. I mean, basically, most of us are in the object game. If we're given a lovely object to do, we'd love to go away and do it and produce the most beautiful and practical thing we can. And I don't think we give a damn, quite frankly, about anything else other than that sequence of operations which produces a beautiful building. You know, if you produce a concert hall which um, you can walk into and, and the greatest symphony in the world just wings away to you from that place, you, you feel you've actually done something. If you go into a, li a little old lady in a, in a sort of very modest house in the middle of a housing scheme who thinks it's lovely, you think you've done something. And, and, and this, to me, is really the importance of being an architect, is in the end, you're offering, you know, like a shopkeeper, um, the best you can. And is there anything more than that you can offer? Well, I, I think the point that I find very interesting, Bob was saying, was this idea of a sort of aura, and the sort of idea that there's a, that we might be getting back to the kind of culture uh, if it's a, maybe it's a commodity one, I don't think very much of housing. So it is a particular thing. I get some, most of these issues concentrate around the housing, housing dilemma, um, and um, or, or and the dilemma of, of other artifacts like furniture and so on. And um, it does seem to me that we're in the business of making something which is more than an artifact. We're actually um, we're actually devising, we're inferring a whole. Uh, whole styles of life um, that, that people might have or might not have. Indeed, the modern movement was very much about that in its ascetic way. And one of the difficulties of the modern movement was its asceticism became associated with poverty. And its only success has really been in those parts of society where people are so wealthy that they don't fear to be associated with poverty. Hence, sort of, you know, sort of shops like Zivaram and so on being successful in selling all that aesthetic furniture. Um, and, um, and it seems to me that um, we now have a problem of, of what sort of um, culture, of commodity culture, we want to be seen with, really. Yeah. And um, I mean, I've, I've, we, we have in our office three private housing schemes sort of on the boards, which are, may or may not go ahead. Um, and um, it's it's really it's kind of really fascinating to see whether one can go on doing what what one feels very strongly about within the culture of architecture that we've inherited and feel very passionately about, and whether that can be um, whether those things that we're making can be seen by our clients who are developers to to be uh, accountable within their world of values as well, and I think that's very interesting because I think that. Um, <coughs> I read Norberg Short's Intentions in Architecture. It made me realise I needed spectacles, actually. I didn't know whether it was a book or what it was. <laughs> um, and I, once I'd finished the book, I didn't need spectacles anymore. However, that's by the way. But the, the, one, the only thing I got out of it was, I think, was the notion that an artefact um, itself only has meaning insofar as the meaning lies somewhere between it and... Um, person who's uh, perceiving it, that, which suggests that any artifact can have a number of different meanings. And um, I'm interested in the idea that um, one way of going on at the moment, certainly the only way I can attach any sort of theory to what we're trying to do, is that um, we are doing things which have a number of very different sorts of meaning which can coexist um, so that we can continue with the meanings which are to do with culture and uh, our culture and the the thing that our clients see in it and the purchasers see in it are other sorts, possibly quite different sorts of meanings to the meanings that, that we see in it. But they're not actually uh, exclusive to each other. It's a, it's a both-and situation rather than an either-or one. I find that Venturi uh, distinction very useful. Um, but we, I don't regard what we're doing as a postmodern at all. I think, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, 
could be a complete misunderstanding on my part, and um, uh, you know, and, and and just a bit ridiculous is to. I mean, the thing that I feel, well, not well, in a way, also in the United States, but but anyway, certainly here. I mean, if one looks at something like the RIBA Journal or or the Review, for that matter, I think you know. Um, certainly, if you compare the Architectural Review of today to uh, the Architectural Review of the 30s, you know, and I don't think that the Architectural Review of the 30s was demagogic, as as much as it what as as it went out of its way to give value to things, you know, or, or actually to a rather wide wide range of things, as a matter of fact. You know. I mean. It is amazing, I think, to look at architectural review of the 30s and realize that somebody would actually use a whole page, you know, to show a concrete wall. That actually, you know, gave a value to a concrete wall, which, uh, I mean, I think there's a strange relationship here, which perhaps is rather difficult to an analyze and all too easy to romanticize. But I do think that uh, because postmodernism is about media hype, and because it is run by the media, and I don't just mean the architectural media, I do mean television, I do mean popularizers of culture all over the goddamn place, uh, I do mean, as I've already named certain names, uh, very intelligent gentlemen, but perhaps one should say more clever than intelligent. You know. But because they stage manage the operation, in some ways, this profession is being demoralized from the outside. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I, I don't know, I mean, I sort of somehow felt, perhaps <coughs> totally incorrectly, that one of the reasons for having these little gatherings was to actually try to re-engender um, some kind of energy to, to uh, do something, you know, in terms of um, uh, creating another kind of platform other than the platform that's determined by the media. Um, well, that, that was the main thing I... I, I and in that I, regard, in Habermas's article, didn't he say that in the end the project of modernism was not yet fulfilled? Yes, I, well, yes. And that reminded me of something that Ada Louise Huxley was said in the Times, that, uh, well, modern architecture has gone too far, so therefore we have postmodernism. And it occurred to me that actually modern architecture hadn't gone far enough. No, exactly. Uh, sort of yeah. it's the Habermas thing at the back yeah. Yeah. in the same place. Yeah. That those ideals, I mean, we've gone all this way and we're in the same place. And as, as you say, this loss of nerve, which is being managed by the media, I mean, the Tom Wolf thing is run by, yeah. Harper's is owned by a big real estate developer. Yeah. Really well, I mean, I mean, I think one of the interesting things is that it, I mean, and, and it's amazing if you talk to uh, American students about uh, to come on the point that Richard raised. I mean, if you talk to American students about rights you're selling in houses, in general, they do not know about them. And uh, you know, it, it took an Englishman to write a book about the Usonian houses of Frankfurt Right. And uh, um, I think they are the most if, if then, you know, the destiny is the suburb, they're, the, they're the, the last effort that anybody made to make the suburb into a culture. Because, uh, I mean, the tendency for the suburb today is to be, on the one hand, economy, distribution, on the other hand, cheap images, not a culture. But, I mean, it seems to me that the incredibly primitive objects are most suburban houses, certainly in the United States, anyway, you know. I mean, they, they, I mean, human beings are very flexible, so... But in terms of, you know, uh, wanting something other than just, uh, you know, uh, the raw means to continue, which, of course, one could say is not necessary, but, I mean, if one's talking about a modern movement not going far enough, if one's talking about imagination, if one's talking about culture, then I think, you know, rights to certain houses were the, the last time anybody really made an effort, you know. But that was certainly not trivial. I mean, that was a. I mean, it was a totally argued case, you know. Uh, yes, I do think there is a, a problem here, which isn't just that we went wrong, like Theo said, because the, we got into too big numbers, or because we didn't do good enough design, or something. You're saying that maybe the modern movement just hasn't succeeded yet. Uh, I think that's very dangerous because I think that the modern movement that will succeed 
will, will have to be one which has got a greater possibility of understanding by the broad masses of people and that there was in fact a loss of meaning between the rational project which was linked in all too easily with utilitarian and finally with base economics and, and reductivism of an extreme kind in the hands of accountancy and so on and the whole question of how people use, see and honour themselves and uh, Kenneth's last point about the the Usonian suburb is that it has got suburban layout, but every bit of architecture in it is architecture. The houses are architecture. They're seen in a Frank Lloyd Wright vision. They're within his charisma and his aura. And that's what brings me back to this question of aura, because Kenneth is also saying that in some way uh, the city has been evacuated. The planners have gone up into political economy and so on. Architects have been forced back down. And the city is now kind of evacuated. Uh, as if in some way we could graft the city we could restore the whole. Now the whole point to me is that the project of modernism is the rational Descartian, Cartesian project of everything understood and controlled according to need. And it seems to me that we have to give up that project because it is not possible to have the whole world at a, at a state of final perfection. It's not possible. The utopianism in the modern movement has to be understood as a projection and not as a final condition. In other words, we have to come to understand what are the conditions of history and how history continues to operate after we have, as it were, crystallized it and seized it and stopped it in a particular image. And there is the secret for me of how we can get a new uh, ongoing thing. We have to work at understanding how individual small pieces of quality can be given out without any assurance of fitting together in the whole, but with the confidence that they're good. And by gum, you know, eventually there are quite a lot of these things around. And society takes them over. See, the, society believes in them again. The only thing I would say, Robert, though, is that everything you've said would not be said by a director of a television station. Right. It's very I don't think television is anything to do with fragments, it's to do with sort of awful gush of universal notions. Well, it's exactly. the one thing which we're exactly, speaking against. I, I love to support you know, the idea that quality is in fragmentary form. And quality, if the fragments can be perceived um, clearly enough, they exude uh, a sense of well-being throughout the whole of the, the urban structure. I mean, that's the magic. And Florence, not because he town planned Florence, because he made certain specific ideas in Florence at a particular time, which was part of a cultural, um, became a, a buoyant cultural idea. Um, highly rationalist. He also, and the, 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 also I, in the words, Peter Crosby gave in to uh, <coughs> mass production and construction. Yes, certainly. But did he ever? Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I don't know about construction, but, but um, an idea that there is a, a, a kind of universality which isn't always perceived, but is intrinsically there, which is a value I think the fact that Kenneth has been putting his notes back inside architectural no, 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 design no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> indicates that we've reached a point where he must not be kept any longer no, no, no. suffer. Can I, <laughs> can I act as ch chairman at this moment and say we've got time for just a couple more comments for those people who've been waiting for the right moment to insert theirs. Anybody feel that, that yes, Nick? Can I raise one, yeah. one point, which is a bit of a change of tack, really, about, um, really it's to do with consumerism and, and the user. And I was very interested, having just been to New York, people were talking about this book of Tom Wolfe's, which he apparently sold 125,000 copies of, which is quite a lot of books. Sure is. A lot it? more than <laughs> um, most architectural books. <coughs> Rainer Bannon has just sold 5,000 copies of his book on Buffalo. They're reprinting. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I was interested in this issue because, uh, in a sense, he's a popularizer and so on. But um, what he seemed to be putting forward to me was simply a... Um, a very simple form of kind of conspiracy theory, really, that, um, you know, architects have been foisting some kind of a, um, uh, a conspiracy on, of, of, of modernism and of modern architecture onto a, a kind of un... a, a, a public <coughs> which can't defend themselves. It seems to be a very simple concept, really. And I, I wondered whether, you know, in a way, the... Uh, the, the sort of alternative 
sort of uh, which is being put forward of, of this postmodern idea, this sort of cosy idea of using bits of old column and clagging on the front of buildings, with, with some kind of pathetic defence against uh, uh, some kind of glimmerings of a defence against um, this sort of conspiracy theory that, that nobody could defend themselves against the ongoing kind of bandwagon of architects who uh, would go on doing buildings which nobody wanted and there was no way of, of stopping them. It seems to me that, that um, you know, he talked about even Johnson saying that uh, the AT&T people said, well, they might perhaps quite slightly like a bit of a kind of pitch on the top of their building and, and him sort of saying, well, all right, you know, I'll do a bit of a notch and a bit of a slant on the top and so on. And even so, he was still totally on top, totally controlled everything. It seems to me the only really, the only real way out of this, it's not, um, you know, postmodernism, which everyone thinks, of, you know, I totally agree with ghastly. Um, it's some kind of um, growing demand on, on the side of the user and, or the consumer, if you want to really lower the level. That, that any sort of glimmering on that side where people are really going to make demands is going to improve the quality of architecture. And I, I think that's the only real uh, way forward. It's not by individual people making nice pieces of architecture. It's not going to do any good at all unless there is some kind of um, comprehension on the side of the user and some kind of growing demand and some kind of uh, growth in that area. And I, I was struck at a recent do I went to, uh, which was Design Day at IBM, having been doing a small building for them. They invited one or two architects who had done things for them, some people from Norman's office. And they were having a kind of design discussion within their uh, own design department. And I was struck by how absolutely incredibly sort of, uh, there is, I suppose, one of the biggest patrons, if you like, of architecture around the world. And this was their design department having design day, talking about design and what they wanted from it. And really, you know, the level of discussion was pretty damn low level. And there was no real philosophical feeling there about what demands they wanted to make from their architects and what they wanted to ask for. And, um, you know, there was some sort of discussion about how you control what... Uh, uh, a level of personalization that people's offices was allowed and whether they could put their kids' paintings up on the walls or not. But, I mean, nobody was really sitting there saying what kind of architecture they want or what kind of quality of architecture they want. What kind of demands were they going to make? And I've taken to asking clients, you know, make demands of me. You know, and they say, well, you know, what do you want me to, what do you want me to ask? <laughs> and I think that's, personally, I think that's the... That's the nub of the problem, and that, I don't think anything's going to really shift until there's some kind of real uh, demanding society growing up, which is going to ask for quality and ask for good architecture and ask for uh, both in the public and, and even down to the small houses. You see, that, that is almost the Greenberg argument, though. That's why I mentioned it. The Clement Greenberg argument about the autonomy of, you know, I mean, the rather snobbish Clement Greenberg argument, or it's an aspect, the reciprocal side of the snobbish Greenberg argument that uh, uh, the, you know, the, the cultivated will do their stuff in an autonomous closed circle until such time as the general demand rises. Now, if you put that on one side, which I, I don't accept the Greenberg argument, you know, uh, and you face the fact that the media runs the game, I mean, I thought it was very interesting, you know, I, I, I looked casually at a radio time, but no, tele yeah, the television program. There was some crazy program about local politics. And the, there was, a, and the synopsis of the program was that in this local area in England, uh, a motorway is going to be put through a certain area. And the question is, are the allotments going to be sacrificed or the golf course? Little cameo thing, sold by BBC television, right? No question that the roadway is not going to go through anywhere, right? Now, that is the third alternative. It's not possible. 
This is already ideology. I mean, the ridiculous thing is that architects, you know, are at the service of the society. They're not, they're not the power, you know. And yet, you know, and that's the cheap <coughs> shot on the part of people like Tom Wolfe and so on and so forth, to, you know, to make them miss that a bunch of German immigrants in the United States, you know, investing, you know, invading the universities changed the whole thing, you know, as though, you know, the elevator and the steel frame and land prices and productive techniques didn't exist and profit is something that no one, is a dirty word that a gentleman from the South is not going to mention. But he spent 125,000? Yeah, sure he did. That's yeah. exactly what he's about. That's right, so he is, of course he is, of course he is. So you're worried about it, so get in there and write mm. something that's going to sell 125,000 copies. Exactly. And the architectural review you see was read by people other than architects in one moment in its history, yes. and perhaps still is. Right. But I mean, the big problem here with Wolf is, is you know, you can you read that book, and I read it on aircraft in an hour and a half, and you giggle, uh, you know, because there are a few nice little jabs, and you know that the media controls the whole damn thing, and that's all that bit is. He did the same thing for the space industry with the right stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's a guy. You know, his his his, his labeling is is going to be good because he's into selling 125,000 times. Every time he takes the pen, which I don't blame him for, he lives well. I know, I know a lovely story about that, by the way, mm -hmm. that James Wines, uh, there was a row in the States between James Wines, uh, Leon Creer, Nassim Scalari, people like that, uh, Frank Gehry, they, they almost came to blows. And because he needed something, you know, to sell 125,000 copies. He went and talked to James Wines about, you know, well, what happened exactly? So James Wines told him the story, and then he said, but you know, I really think you should talk to Leon Creer about his side of the story. He said, Leon Creer? That's a transatlantic phone call. I don't think I need that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, what proportion, uh, what percentage of housing in the United States actually involves architects and uh, you know, I mean in terms of that Tom Wolfe book I mean from our house to the bar house I mean well, uh, it isn't our house is it who's head of the bar house I mean <laughs> in, 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 in terms of you know the uh, the larger percentage of, uh, of homeowners home users um, it's an, an elitist and yeah, that's the yeah. thing that worries me is that, is that a lot of the, what we're talking about is 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 so elitist it's so in, introverted it's so no, worryingly trivial. Like but on the other hand, we know there is an elite, right? There is, after all. You know? And what's, what's disturbing is that the level of discussion within the elite is very strange stuff. I mean, I think that that's what's disturbing. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, there's uh, a... You know, very uh, I mean, I don't know if you've seen the latest or one of the more recent issues of Domus with its, uh, with its various pleas to, um, to ensure the sanctity of Spears architecture. Uh, but the interesting thing is, I think, is that postmodernism, which I mean, I, if anything, is a conspiracy to the postmodernism. I mean, it, and, it, and, it, and it is a complete um, degeneracy of a, a language that's 2,000 years old. But, um, I, I mean, I, I think, and uh, one has to, I think one needs to, that's where it needs to be put. I mean, Tom Wolf, it seems to me, represents that kind of um, popularization. Um, but, but I think what, what is interesting, in a way, is the sudden resurgence one finds around us at the present time of, <clears throat> of, of, the, of, of the whole sort of right-wing question of the, the powerful um, author, uh, um, patron of a, with authority who commissions an individual architect um, uh, uh, to do something for him. And I think that, I mean, what, you know, um, Norman in, in, in Hong Kong, I mean, it is, it is, it is an individual working with another individual which produces that kind of authority. And, and the difficulty, I think, of, of the whole, um, of the enormous promise, utopian promise of what happened, you know, has happened in the last 25 years, has been this question of, in some way, tr an individual trying to produce architecture for an individual, but actually dealing with a whole web of faceless people. And, and he, is now, it, he, the architect, has very rarely had the authority, it seems to me, endowed in him, I mean, by the patron. By, by the man who's commissioned, by the individual who's commissioning it, it, to enable him actually to do the job. And, and after all, the work of architect has, it has endured in time has frequently been, you know, this uh, an individual commissioning an architect to do an object. And I think, I mean, it's, you know, it is, it is, I think, quite interesting, the whole sort of resurgence of Lutchens and the rest, you know, the, uh, the sort of whole right-wing business of, 
of a, of a, um, a patron and an architect working together and producing an object, and, and, and somehow you know, Gavin Stamp for the rest, um, I, you know, I, I really idolising um, Luxor's work, and I think in a way which is totally out of proportion with with the man's merit. Sorry, it's a day <laughs> <laughs> I've just been reading Indian Summer. I don't know if everybody has bothered to buy the book. It cost a fortune. This is this Baker and Lutchens thing in, in New Delhi. And the, the interesting thing, if, if, from your point, is that there was a very doctrinaire statement uh, off, off the cuff uh, as Brasilia was uh, in a sort of six-week visit by Lutchens and the man from the GLC and so on. And, and they say, we will do this. And they put down the road grid. And they design, well, Lutchens designs a, basically one object. Uh, he brings his mate, Baker, in, who designs another object. Baker then does the dirty on Lutchens and, and puts his piece up on the hill. And you can't see the Lutchens thing, so it's, which is very amusing. But they also lay down a grid that talks about this grand plan that relates to Canberra and Washington. And of course, it never happens because nobody can afford to put the pieces in. So in, in a sense, you've got an urban design solution, a road grid, uh, ley lines, uh, uh, arches, uh, and so on, and bungalows on a seven-lane highway. Uh, and essentially, that sums up uh, 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 symmetry, uh, whatever it was and whatever it was. Uh, and in, in, in a sense, it's as doctrinaire, this is the problem, that, that uh, architecture, historically, uh, and architects have played a very doctrinaire game. Uh, and we don't like it because the media are playing a doctrinaire game and have actually opened uh, the eyes of people to, to those sorts of games. I mean, I, I was amazed when I read this book uh, of the intrigue of, of how Lachins uh, obtained, and the letters he writes to the king and so on, to, to pull this commission. Uh, I, I mean, absolutely extraordinary. I mean, he'd be in jail. If, if, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you see, we look back, but we look back on and the history that you would uh, support. All for it. Well, should be. It's absolutely bloody disgraceful. <laughs> and, and it's laid on India and so on, and, and, and they've produced these amazing colour photographs <laughs> that are very pretty. I mean, it could be Hollywood now. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is that then the media turn this, and, and the trouble is, we all we all can't see that. I mean, I, I go back from the clue, and actually, you can't see the whatever it is for the message. I, I, in <laughs> fact, uh, it, it, it's much more important that we should uh, not listen to Wolf, but look at what Wolf is looking at. And I think that's the clue to it. You, he's looking. He's actually looking at. It. He's getting the message wrong, maybe, but he's out there looking. I, I mean, I don't know how many of you here. Watch Bride's Head Revisited. Probably Not most anymore. of you. Huh? Not anymore. No, no, but when, when it was on, I mean, actually, no, but, it, but, but it, it, it's gotten, it, it, you know, I'd be amazed at how many people, uh, how many people here watch Coronation Street, Dallas, I don't know, and all those uh, soap operas that are actually pushing messages out um, much strong, much more uh, strongly than, than Wolf. Wolf is uh, insignificant. Mm. That stuff is on that box all the time. And the message of, of, uh, of what society is about, maybe right, uh, wrongly, but it's going out in, in, in a much more... Now, I uh, would like to respond to that, Ron, because it does seem to me that uh, in the modern movement, with its utopian background, its rationalist framework, and its utilitarian and socialist uh, uh, vision, did in fact produce a reduction of architecture to a simpler set of parameters. It did, and this has led to a, a certain rejection. Now we've got people uh, re overreacting, putting back in colored flowers and all the lot just to try and get the audience's reaction again. But there is a fault in the project of modernism as it was envisaged by people like Hannes Myers in the Frankfurt School, I would say. And that's to say it was a reductive model of what would be okay. And it would be okay if everybody had their adoptive model. So it went with a, a socialist 
uh, form of life. And after that, you know, the state withers away and everybody starts doing their own thing. All that's unreal. We had no idea how you would get to that state. Let me just say about Delhi, which I visited again a few years ago, uh, one of Lutchen's uh, objects in uh, setting the thing up was to create a grand plan. And where he created the grand plan on the ground was to plant trees. Forty, fifty years later, those trees are, are big, they make streets, whatever's behind, and what's behind is usually a, a big villas or the old uh, imperial hotel and now increasingly modern office buildings. And by gum, those trees act quite well to screen the office buildings and to give the thing, uh, and Indians that I talk to all love the new city. But you could say that you about know. Frankfurt. Yes, but, no, but, but, but what I'm actually saying is exactly. that the fag, the fag end of the imperial tradition and all the intrigue, I agree with you, it's horrible to envisage it, but in a certain kind of way, we architects, I think, have to learn to accept the conditions of life which lie outside our technicity. Our, our wish to look upon a thing as only a technical problem means that in a way we become illiterate at the level of general culture, which I think is what Ken's referring to when he said the media then are in right. control. Yes, yes, yes. If you look at all those things, Coronation <laughs> Street, right, as you read there, full of architecture, and architecture is playing its role in the story. And by gum, we've got to get back into well, that that's story. All, what I'm that's all I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. And right. this is what Wolf's looking at, but his, his message is a different message. He's no better than Conrad Jameson. Yes. <laughs> now, time for well, one more. I did promise you one more. <laughs> Anybody got a considered five minute statement to make? <sighs> well, I was going to make a considered five minute statement about this before an hour ago, but I've forgotten it now. I, I do think that uh, the, the opposition between um, positive and arbitrary values. Uh, is something which one can look at naively as a development of culture and think how clever old uh, Perrault was that he actually brought all that Vitruvian stuff into the modern age. He gave a new impulse to the idea of fine proportions by showing it to be arbitrary, therefore interesting, which wasn't, of course, how the others in the academy felt. They felt he'd undermined their whole magical, mystical business. To see it in those two ways would be to see a dialectic in it, to see it as nothing to do with intellectual or philosophical ideas, but purely as the agency of the king and the ideology of the central state with Colbert is another interesting way of seeing it. Uh, it's not the whole story either. It seems to me that uh, uh, what Ken has presented does have within it a certain ambiguity, which is that the, pop, the, the virtues that Colbert, that, that Perrault named, which was the good materials, precision, and symmetry are in fact the attributes of the architecture of power under the king. And to generalize those as general attributes of all architecture seems to me to be something we can only do with care. Uh, especially if it, it turns out we then need to bring in Louis Kahn with his sense of structure and his romantic idea that human values could be brought into relation with, with nature, which is another set of ideas altogether. To put together Perrault and Kahn and leave them, as Kenneth has done, uh, hanging is to set up an interesting problem, but the answer to that problem will only be found, in my view, if we become more conscious of the dialectical process by which ideas get accepted by society and stop kidding ourselves that our technicity gives us the secret to simply line it all up and hand it to people finished. So, Mr. Philip Johnson, ending. You'll have to explain it.